when dealing with pressure, we have an equation that governs it. And maybe we should start right there. Um, I'm going to show you that there. So we have an equation P equals F over A. Now, I've sometimes seen it with a capital, sometimes with a lowercase. It doesn't really matter. But this is P equals F over A. Maybe we better define things. And so we have P, which is the pressure. Now, pressure is all about a push. You know this when you put your hands together, for example, when you push on them, right? You feel a pressure. You feel a, a push. So that pressure is measured in a lot of different units. The main one is called Pascal. But you might also see things like Tor. Um, there are other units, let's say, like Atmosphere. Uh, what else is there? There's bars. There's even millimeters of mercury. But the main one that we use is Pascal's. Now, F is a force. So whatever force you're giving, and force is written in Newtons. And A is the area. That's the surface area that that force is spread out. So that'll be in meters squared, for example. So let's just say you take your force and you divide it by an area and there you get the definition of pressure. Now I like this picture here of this lady, for example, um, you know, with a dog. The dog doesn't look very happy, but that's also because there's a lot of pressure uh, because there's a large force probably due to gravity going downwards. And there's not a very big area. This right here would be the small little area. Right, so a large force divided by a small area, a large number by a small number, equals a big pressure. Now this actually explains a bed of nails as well. See, the reason why you don't want to sit your bum, for example, on, let's say, uh, only one nail, is because your entire force would be spread out over a tiny, 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 tiny little area. Let's say I just had like a little nail right here this woman was sitting on. What if there was just a, a tiny little nail there? So if there was just a tiny little nail that she wanted to sit on, you know, I guess the nail sort of goes like this, then this would be very painful for her, obviously, because um, all this force over an extremely small surface area, a large number divided by a really small number makes a very big pressure. And pressure is what pierces, it, you know, pushes through you. So this would be bad for you. That's why you don't want to sit on just one nail. But that being said, haha, but <laughs> that was not even on purpose. Um, what if you're laying on a bed of nails? In other words, your weight, even though these are real nails and they're really sharp, you don't have to be some sort of Zen guru or some meditation master. All you need to do is just realize that, hey, physics is on my side. Because your entire force, let's say, I think this is Ellen, for example, um, uh, on her TV show, I think she had this guy on who was trying to show her that, you know, ooh, you can do magic. But it's not magic, it's just physics. It's even better than magic, I guess. So here, can you see, she's got her entire force. So her force of her weight, right? Because this right here, we have a gravitational force going down. That entire force is spread out over a very large area. Look at the area, you know, where she's actually touching the nails. It's a very large area compared to a tiny little thing or even one nail. So a large force divided by a large area will make the pressure a lot smaller. That's why anyone can lay on a bed of nails. In fact, I had my own seat of nails and I would always have people sit on it just to show them there's no problem at all. It doesn't it doesn't hurt. You just have to, you know, be careful how you get on and off of it because you don't want to, you know, put all your weight on just your little hand as you get on. But as long as you're getting on on and off of it carefully, you can totally lay on it. It won't hurt. It won't pierce you. It's again because the area is so large. Now, how do we actually deal with these things? We can actually deal with them a gas in a box as well. So if we have a gas that's in a box, we can also deal with pressure in that sense. And then pressure is all about, so the pressure is really about, um, how can I say it here? It's how the molecules will hit the walls. So in this case here, we're going to consider, again, it's about a force over an area. So a force is, you know, when they hit. So how the molecules hit the walls. Maybe it'll help to illustrate this with a little example. So I'm going to use up this one here with, uh, was it gas properties? So this is another PHET animation. So again, I've got my little guy in a spacesuit because outside is a vacuum. Remember, this here is a thermometer. And here I can add or remove heat. So what I can do then is just take this thing here, just open it and close it, and there we go. So now let's take a look then what really happens here. This right here, the pressure, is all about how these molecules are hitting the walls. Can you see? So then it's like 0.3 atmospheres. I've got my little dude right here, and this is all about how they're hitting the walls. 
I want you to notice though, before I even started, before I even get going, look carefully, there's almost no pressure here until they start hitting the walls, and then the pressure increases. Because right, once there's more of them hitting a wall. If I put in more of them, can you see that there's more hitting the walls, so the pressure goes up. Can you see that? So now the pressure rises because there's more forces against the wall per unit area. So this is how we define the pressure. Now you feel pressure uh, in a lot of different cases. I mean, you can feel it if you go underwater. This is actually a picture of my wife Inga when we were taking our diving courses. I just think it's such a beautiful picture. We're in the, um, the Red Sea, so we're in Egypt. And uh, so here we are looking for fishies. But I don't know if you've ever been diving before, but as you go down, you feel an increase in pressure. And that's because, again, the pressure is a push on you, right? It's a force over an area. You feel a large force from the water because there's a lot of water above you. So as you go down deeper, so maybe we'll put this down. So deeper means more pressure. And conversely then, I mean, if you've ever been even in a swimming pool, you go down, you can feel the pressure on your ears, can't you? You can feel your ears sort of want to pop. And conversely, you can have this extreme if you go uh, shallower, or even if you go like up in altitude. What if you go up to the mountains? Then there's less and less pressure, and that affects your body as well. So these are real things that really do affect us. I thought it'd be really interesting to give you this question. Why Mars doesn't have liquid water on its surface? I mean, the planet Mars used to have liquid water. That's because a long time ago, it had a much thicker atmosphere. So right now, it still has an atmosphere. I'm just trying to draw this little sort of layer around it. I'm trying to draw a circle. I'm not very good at drawing, but this right here is the atmosphere here. Let's just say it's this little sort of envelope of gas going all the way around it, of course. That would be the atmosphere. Now, what an atmosphere does, the atmosphere, the air pressure, for example, on Earth here, we have now, this is a lady who's crazy giant. I don't think it's very realistic. <laughs> She's over, I guess, is Africa, and this here would be the Middle East, um, at least starts of it. But in any case, this one right here then, so she's this giant crazy lady here. Uh, they're just trying to show this to show that when you're here on Earth, for example, you feel air pressure. That's actually the atmosphere pushing on you because there's a force that it's pushing on you over the area of your surface here, over your own surface area. And that's good because it turns out pushing on things keeps water liquid. With enough pressure, you keep water liquid. So in the past, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, and because of that, it was able to push on the liquid enough to actually keep it liquid. But what happened? Well, in the past, for some reason, we're not entirely sure the exact reasons, although we have some good ideas, um, Mars lost a lot of its atmosphere. So I'm going to say this, so lost much of its atmosphere. This is what happens. So because Mars lost a lot of its atmosphere, that means the pressure went down, and that means uh, liquid water was not possible because the pressure is too low. Now, does that mean there could be liquid water under the surface? Perhaps. But we do know that it used to have liquid water, and now it doesn't. In fact, there's very strong evidence to show that it's losing its atmosphere. And the reason why, we actually think it's related to its magnetic field. Turns out the magnetic field will protect the atmosphere, and it's not really very magnetic anymore, its core. So we're trying to figure out why that is. So there is a NASA satellite on its way out there to go and actually check this out and see how much of its atmosphere is actually being lost. Because this might help us to understand what might happen to the Earth in the future. So this is, I think, pretty interesting. So it doesn't have liquid water on the surface anymore because it lost its atmosphere, a lot of it at least. It's still got some. Uh, but it's not very large pressure. So because the pressure went down, liquid water is no longer possible because there's not enough atmospheric pressure. See, on Earth, we have a much thicker atmosphere, which is good. That gives us enough pressure to keep our water liquid. Now, what we can do then is look at what we call ideal gases. So here we have ideal gases, and this is what we do. We look at... We look at um, a volume of gas in a box. So let's just say we look at this this little box here. So I'll just consider this, maybe I'll draw it over here. So a kinetic model, let's say we have a little box here. And in this box we have little molecules. So again we have a little circle going this way, maybe one going that way, maybe one going this way. These are little molecules in the box. 
So, in real life, though, gases aren't quite like this. In real life, gases are much more complex. So what we do, we try to simplify our life. We try to simplify things for us to make it you know, easier to work with. So we call them ideal gases. So ideal gases are going to be ones where, so we consider like a, a real gas, we, we sort of make it ideal. An ideal means easier to work with. So we're going to consider things on a macroscopic, in other words, on a large scale, we're going to consider that they have no forces between them. So the little molecules there aren't going to exert forces on each other. In real life, of course they do. But we're just going to say, ah, just pretend they're like billiard balls just bouncing off each other and nothing else. We're going to assume that the uh, pressure is low. That's also important to us, with low pressure. We're going to assume that the temperature is moderate. In other words, not too crazy hot, not too crazy cold. No extremes allowed. And we're also going to say that it has to work for all uh, pressure and volume and temperature. Uh, now, there are lots more than these for ideal gases, but these are just some of them here. So when we say kinetic model, kinetic means, you know, moving objects. So what we do is we consider just molecules bouncing around. This is like the main thing we consider in an ideal gas. Molecules bounce around. So that's what we have. We just have the molecules are just bouncing around. So then what happens then? Remember about speed, though. The faster they go, this is really important, actually. So the faster they go, so the faster they move, that means the higher temperature. Because remember, we defined temperature as the average kinetic energy. So because of that, this is because temperature is proportional to kinetic energy. I put the little alpha here. Temperature is equal to some number times the kinetic energy. And because of that, that leads to a higher pressure. So this is actually really important to us. Because what this tells us then is that if they go faster, the temperature is going to go up, and that means then there's going to be more pressure. This is really helpful for us. This helps us out. But also, if we take the volume, what if we took the size of this box and we decreased it, let's say? Let's just look at another example. So if the volume decreases, so I make this a smaller box, what happens then? Well, we consider that the pressure will increase. Now, the reason why the pressure will increase, oops, I didn't write it very well, did I? Increases. So if the volume decreases, the pressure increases. And that's all because the pressure is all about how often these things hit the walls. And because of that, of course, then the temperature also increases. So we can look at that with our little handy dandy animation again. So let's take our little animation. Where are you, little guy? There we go. So I'm just going to reset this. So first I'm just going to put this in. I'm just going to put in some of these little materials here. So I want you to just take a look. The temperature is 300 Kelvin and the atmosphere is, let's, so let's just wait for it to settle. It seems to be about 0.3. So I just said before that if we add temperature to it, if we add heat, we're going to cause these little guys to move faster. And remember, moving faster gives them more kinetic energy. More kinetic energy means more temperature. So as I add heat, this should go up. That should make sense. But also, they're going to hit the walls more. And because of that, the, the pressure should go up. So let's see. As I add, watch the temperature go up. See that number here? This is going up, but also the atmospheric pressure is going up. See, now it's up at 0.6, whereas before it was a lot lower. It was at 0.3 only. So that's one thing we can test. Another one was, remember we just talked about, what if I decrease the volume? Let's see what happens there. So I take this one right here and I decrease the volume. So I'm going to take my little dude here who was out in space because it's a vacuum, and I'm going to decrease the volume. So when I drag him over to decrease the volume, watch carefully what happens to the temperature and the pressure. So the temperature is at 300, the pressure is at about 0.3 something. So as I make the volume smaller, there's going to be more hits. First of all, I make them go faster. See, the temperature went up, but also the pressure went up because, again, they're hitting the walls more. Of course, I can go too much, and I think then we'll cause the top to blow. I think if you do it right, then the top sort of explodes. So you can do all sorts of funny things with the sizes of it. But I hope that at least that helps to illustrate what we mean by a kinetic model. They're just billiard balls bouncing off each other. And we can see sort of an effect of what happens at least um, qualitatively by decreasing the volume or increasing the volume or increasing the speed and decreasing the speed and see what happens with the temperature and the pressure.